We're also seeing more and more instances of so-called risk share agreements being put in place for new medications. What role does NICE play in those agreements and how well have you actually seen them work? Well, we have an independent advisory committee that looks at the proposal that comes from the company. Remember, it's entirely a matter for the company to decide whether or not they want to put uh, one of these schemes forward. That evaluation then goes to the Department of Health, and it's up to ministers to decide whether or not the scheme is appropriate and suitable. Uh, and if they do, then we will then play it into the appraisal. Obviously, if ministers decide the scheme isn't suitable or appropriate, then uh, it falls away and we just continue as if a scheme hadn't been proposed. There are various kinds of schemes. They all um, generate a burden for the health system and indeed for companies. It's extra work for everybody. But they're important um, if, as on occasions they have done, that they make the difference between NICE being able to support the use of a new drug um, or not. So there are mixed views about these schemes from everybody who's involved, um, but I think at the moment they play an important role in the managed access of some new pharmaceuticals into the NHS. Let's talk about implementation of NICE guidelines because unfortunately we still see some variability across the country. So what do you think needs to be done to ensure a more uniform application of the recommendations you make? I think we have to remember that the NHS is an enormously complicated organism. There are tens of thousands of decision makers that might influence the pace and consistency of the adoption of any one of the uh, forms of guidance that NICE has issued. So implementation, however strong the evidence base, isn't just simply a question of NICE issuing the instruction and the NHS immediately and slavishly adhering to it. We've always been conscious that we have to mount the arguments that persuades individual health professionals and those who work with them that uh, changing their practice, changing the resourcing of services, sometimes quite radically, is justified by the evidence. And we're conscious that we have to mount a good argument and we have to promote that effectively. The system as a whole uh, has an important part to play as well because those who are making decisions in the NHS, those who are trying to square the circle in sometimes very difficult circumstances, those who are reconciling competing demands for services locally, need to know the importance that the Department of Health, that the NHS at a national level places on the adoption of guidance that NICE issued. Now through the years there have been various ways in which that's been articulated. Of course recently uh, the innovation report published by the Department of Health has talked about the importance of all the players involved, uh, the department, the NHS broadly, the life science industries, um, medical and uh, other health professionals and NICE coming together to identify the barriers to rapid adoption of NICE guidance and to look for ways of overcoming that. And all of that has to work in the changing architecture of the NHS. So it's going to continue to be a challenge, I think, but it is an important challenge. I think we've probably got past the point where people wonder why we've got an organisation like NICE, at least those who are involved in health in this country. And obviously within the health technology appraisal process, Pharma could say that the increasing evidence required increases the cost for development of new drugs. So do you think ultimately there's a risk that you could be dissuading innovation? I think it, it's increasingly important. I know there's a cost involved. I know there's effort involved. But if we don't, as a health system, and this is, I think, true of health systems around the world, regardless of how they might fun be funded, if we don't spend a little bit of effort uh, critically examining the value proposition from the perspective of patients and from the perspective of the health system of the new things that we have available, particularly in circumstances where the resources available are becoming tighter, then I think the potential is that we'll make some very big mistakes in allocating resources which are not in the interests of patients. I think it's in the interests of life sciences companies, including the pharmaceutical industry, to engage with organisations like NICE that have demonstrably 
good quality methods and processes for evaluating their products. I think it can strengthen the value proposition, the business case for adoption, however it's characterised, of the products that they want to drive into the health system if they had that independent objective evaluation. I think it's in the interests of patients because we need to know what's really going to bring the prospects of improved outcomes. Most things that we look at, we find some value in. So this is not um, a problem that we're facing a tidal wave of um, interventions that are not going to add anything in clinical practice. What we want to encourage are interventions that really bring big gains so that the resources that we do have available for uh, new interventions being introduced into the health system um, really do bring significant gain to patients. And finally, it must be very flattering to see other countries adopting very similar processes to NICE, and indeed you're offering your consulting advice abroad now. What kind of areas do you advise on and how do you see that model progressing? Well, there's long been international interest in NICE, but it's only in the last few years that we've been able to allocate some resource uh, to respond to that interest in a way that allows us to spend time with the departments of health um, or the agencies in other countries that have an interest in the different aspects of what we do. And that, as that, that interest is really right across the board. It certainly isn't just in evaluating new pharmaceuticals. We've worked uh, in countries like China and Turkey and Georgia where there's growing interest in the use of clinical practice guidance that covers the whole range of interventions. There's lots of interest in the approach that we take to engaging with patients and the public. So all sorts of things attract the interests of uh, countries outside the UK and we're very happy to respond as we can. It's still a pretty small outfit and one of the big challenges we have um, is getting someone to pay for that activity. Uh, quite often, um, the, in fact indeed so far, the norm has been for third party payers. The World Bank, for example, has supported quite a lot of NICE's activity. Um, so that's the big challenge for us. We're not a conventional consultancy outfit. Um, we're very much a niche player, but with a very big brand name behind us. Sir Andrew, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. It's been great to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.